1 Timothy 3, 14 to 16. I write these things to you, hoping to come to you soon. But if I should be delayed, I have written so that you will know how people ought to act in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. And most certainly, the mystery of godliness is great. He was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, there's a sermon outline there. Uh, Inside your newsletters, some questions, uh, household questions up on the top right. And uh, if you find the sermon as incomprehensible as the creed, you can listen to it again during the week uh, once Peter has put it up. Uh, Anglicans can be described in a number of ways, and uh, there's some that are humorous, there's some that are not so humorous. For example, I've heard that Anglicans are people who sing like this. I've heard that Anglicans are people who love a good morning tea. I've heard that Anglicans at the moment are unbelievably confused. I've heard that Anglicans always are people who sit on the fence and struggle to make their minds up. But let me tell you, I think there's a better definition of what it means to be Anglican. We're the only denomination in the world that has something like this, the Book of Common Prayer. Now, this is my great-grandfather's. He was a minister in Wales before he came to Australia, and his first parish when he landed in Grafton was in Varel. He was given a horse and he was told to ride west, young man. And so he did for two days. Anglicans are also known for having another book like this called the Book of Homilies, which is a whole set of sermons you can read if you don't know how to write a sermon. We are the only mainstream denomination in the world that has our service structure in a book available to everyone. No other denomination has that. Now, it's not just in a book because that book is actually spread out into our culture. Uh, The Book of Common Prayer has actually influenced the English language, our literature and our art in a way that is astounding. Dermot McCulloch, who is a professor of history in England, describes it as one of a handful of texts to have decided the future of a whole world language. Just this week, as I was chatting to someone, they used a phrase, movable feast, to describe a mess. Well, actually, movable feast is from the prayer book to describe the Lord's Supper. When you talk about ashes to ashes and dust to dust, that's the book of common prayer. Until death do us part, that's the book of common prayer. So the Book of Common Prayer hasn't just defined how we do stuff in church, it's actually affected how we speak in our towns, how we communicate, and how we make sense of our world. And so on a day like today, when we remember the Reformation, I thought, let's get familiar with the Book of Common Prayer. Let's see if what we do lines up with that, or more importantly, let's see if what we do lines up with the Bible. So I'm going to look at three questions today. What does the Bible say about God's people gathering and what it looks like? What does the Book of Common Prayer do and does it match the Bible? And thirdly, how does what we do here each Sunday stack up against the Bible and the Book of Common Prayer? Let me pray and then we're going to dive into it together. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, It's really remarkable that we can sit here and read literature written so many hundreds of years ago, but know that it is your living word that speaks to us today. Father, thank you for the way in which you've preserved your word and preserved your people, and not just preserved your people, but grown it through your word. Father, as we think today about our history, help us to give thanks for what you have done, but also to look forward, desiring to know you, through what you have said in Jesus' name. Amen. I have point two on the outline earlier on this year. If you remember, we did a sermon series on church. Hebrews chapter 12, 18 to 24 was our reading each week, and Jess has actually referred to that 
already in the kids' talk because during that sermon series we came up with this definition of church. Church is the physical gathering of God's people in one place, at one time, by God, around God, with God. Now, when you look at that definition, church is the physical gathering of God's people in one place at one time, by God, around God, and with God, and you come up with a number of very simple observations about church and what the Bible says it is. Uh, let me just give you five or six. First, church is when God's people gather with God in one place with one God to hang out for fellowship. I was there in the Garden of Eden, wasn't it? Uh, It's there at the end of all time in the book of Revelation. Uh, It's there at Mount Sinai when God brings his people out of Egypt and says, I'm your God, you're my mob. Uh, It's there right throughout the New Testament. It's even there when Jesus is talking as he comes to create the church. And that leads to the second observation. Who does the church belong to? It belongs to Jesus. In Matthew 16, verses 17 to 19, he talks about his church and he is the one who's going to build it. He buys it with his blood, Ephesians chapter 2. She's his bride for all time, Revelation 21. It exists, it's created, it's brought into being when God's word goes out, 1 Peter chapter 1. The church belongs to Jesus. He made it, he builds it, and he does it with his word. Which leads to the third observation, and you heard it in that reading that I brought from 1 Timothy 3. The church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. Our world is full of searches for truth, isn't it? And it's really quite an easy search to get an answer. You just go to where God's people are hanging out around God's word. The church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. It's built on the truth that godliness is not a concept or something you can buy. Godliness is a human being called Jesus Christ who lived, died and rose so that sinners could come back to God. That means that, fourth, everything done when God's people gather is about building up, buttressing safeguarding, proclaiming that truth. You would have picked it up in Lynn's reading in 1 Corinthians 14. Everything done when God's people gather is building work. The word used in the Greek, edification, is the word you'd use for building a house. So your local builder is your local edifier. And the language is very clear when you look at all the images Because God describes his people as a building, a temple, a household. It's all building stuff. So when they gather, they're about building that building. We've been talking about a building project over the last few weeks, haven't we? It's the building that says, here is God, and this is what he's done about your sin. Which means fifth, at the very heart of it, is the word of God. When we just heard that, at the very heart, of God's people gathered, is the word of God. Colossians 3, whatever you do, whenever you're together, whatever you are doing in that time together, it has to come out of God's word. And God's word, sixthly, is the very revelation of the nature of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. It's what God has breathed out from his very character so that the building can be made that is fit for him to hang out with and to dwell in. So there's six ideas about church and the gathering of God's people that is church from God's word. At the heart of the gathering of God's people is God's word. It's both the guts and the heart as well as the shape of that gathering. It's the substance that brings that community into existence and then it's actually the contour of that whole community together. And we need to get both those ideas together. It's the substance and the shape. It's the substance and the shape. It's what we say. It's what's woven through everything we do in prayers and in our readings and in our songs 
and in our conversation. But then it's also the shape of it. And so when you sit down and you look at all the slides we have in a service, you should have a summary of the good news of Jesus. We meet God. We respond to God. We know God's nature and we know our own. We confess to God. We're assured of his forgiveness and then we stand to sing his praises and we come to him in prayer and we then build as we hear his word read and explained and then we go out into the world to tell the world how good he is. That's the gospel, isn't it? The shape, the guts. Well, Thomas Cranmer was passionate about that. I'm at point three on the outline. He's the bloke responsible for putting this book together, Thomas Cranmer. He was educated at Cambridge. He was regarded as a man who was very gentle and kind. He was known for being quiet. He was a scholar. And many people think he was probably ill-equipped for the politics of the Reformation. He was not a man who was separated from the hard stuff in life. After he finished his studies at Cambridge, and been appointed to a position as a lecturer, he suddenly lost his job because his marriage was thought to be injudicious, and so he was sacked. That first wife of his, she died in childbirth, giving birth to their first child. He was reinstated because the marriage no longer existed. He was reinstated to his job at Cambridge, and then he travelled extensively in Europe. He was sent to Europe to argue the case for Henry VIII in politics and religion. While he was in Europe, he met his future wife, the niece of a man called Andreas Osiander, one of the key guys in the Reformation in Europe, and he married her. In 1533, he returned to England, and he was asked by Henry VIII to become the Archbishop of Canterbury, the head of the English church. Now, that was a tricky proposition, because it was illegal for clergy to be married, and he already was. There were significant negotiations and not emails but letters sent across back and forth on the English Channel, and finally later in 1533, Cranmer became Archbishop of Canterbury. Now, I think Henry VIII and Cranmer were both reasonably pragmatic. They saw in each other an opportunity to get what they wanted, By this stage, Cranmer was soundly reformed. He spent a lot of time at Cambridge in the pub at the White Horse Inn with a bunch of other students, and what they did at the pub was slightly different to what we do at our pubs. They drank and they read. They gathered in the pub to read the writings of Martin Luther. Every time something new was written by Luther, it was printed off and shipped over to England and they'd gather at the White Horse Inn around a schooner and theology. So by the time he was Archbishop of Canterbury, he was thoroughly converted to the truth that Jesus Christ alone is our salvation. By God's grace alone, received by faith alone, revealed in the scripture alone to the glory of God alone. In 1533, as he attempts to reform the English church, Henry VIII is a little wary, and so he continually blocks him off. But by the end of Henry VIII's time, he'd at least done this. There was a Bible in plain English in every church. That's a reasonable achievement, isn't it? Uh, They were chained because they didn't want people stealing them, but there was a Bible in plain English in every church. Henry VIII dies, and he's succeeded by his son, Edward VI, Under Edward VI, who at this point is only seven, eight or nine, the Reformation in England gathers steam. Cranmer gathers together 12 trusted clergy and they decide to rewrite the liturgy, the structure of what you do in church in line with what they understood the truth to be, that Jesus Christ alone paid for their sins. They took aspects of church services at that time in Latin. They took aspects of services way back through to the early church and they put together this thing here called the Book of Common Prayer. And in 1549, alongside the Act of Uniformity, this became the standard for every church gathering in the kingdom. In fact, it was a legal requirement for every citizen to go to church on a Sunday. It was illegal not to go to church on a Sunday. 
The Book of Common Prayer has a number of parts. It has services in it for morning and evening prayer. Uh, if you were someone going to work in early in the morning, you could go to church on your way, a 25-minute service. As you came home, you would go to church in the evening for evening prayer. You would do that five days a week, oh, Saturday as well, and then Sunday you would go to a service of Holy Communion, as they called it. There were services of baptism, marriage, funeral services. It contained prayers for all parts of life, for harvest time, for going off to war, for raising your children. It contained a lectionary, a set of Bible readings where you would read through the whole Bible. You'd do the Old Testament once, the New Testament three times, and the Psalms at least three times in a year if you went to church in the system set out. Imagine that. You can't read. You can't afford a Bible, but if you go to church, you'll hear God's word read to you all year. By the end, it contains the 39 articles, which are the statement of the summary of Anglican understanding of what the Bible says. And in time, Cramer put together what's called the Book of Homilies because clergy were really ill-equipped to write sermons that communicated the truth. And so you would have a service and a sermon that would point, point you to Jesus. Uh, Edward the Sixth died. Mary ascended to the throne after a brief period of tumult. Mary wanted to return the realm to the pre-Henry VIII period of religious observance. Cramer retained his position as Archbishop of Canterbury, but there was immense pressure on the men. By 1556, he'd been imprisoned. He'd been stripped of his office as bishop and he faced daily personal sustained and vicious pressure to publicly deny what he believed about Jesus. Eventually he did sign a document in private saying, I recant everything that I've publicly stated. Uh, In order to make an example of him, on March the 21st in 1556, Cranmer was taken to the main church in Oxford to publicly preach a sermon that made clear that he had given up on Jesus. As he stood up to preach that sermon, he publicly stated that he'd sinned, that he'd signed a document in error and that he trusted in Jesus. Before he'd even finished his sermon, the crowd had drowned him out. They ripped him from the pulpit. They took him to the main street in Oxford and burned him at the stake. As the flames rose up, the first part of his body that he thrust into the flames was his right hand because that had been the member that had caused him to sin. Whatever else you want to say about the Book of Common Prayer, he's not a man who was distant from daily life, is he? He lost his first wife. He lost his first job. He sinned by turning his back on Jesus. He was burned at the stake for believing that Jesus Christ alone was saviour. This is not a book written in an ivory tower, is it? It's not written by a bloke who doesn't understand the things that we struggle with. It's written by a man who is just as human as we are who knew all the same struggles and then died for Jesus. So what did he intend? What was he aiming to do? Well, I think he had five simple aims. That's why I gave you the preface last week, to have a look at those aims. I'm just going to take you very quickly through it. I'm going to get Hattie to move through some slides. So Hattie, can you bring up that first slide, please? See if it comes up. I'll read them. Don't stress. First... At the heart of the Book of Common Prayer was Cranmer's desire for the Bible to be at the heart of God's people gathered. Let me read this. That all the whole Bible, or the greatest part thereof, should be read over once in the year, intending thereby that the clergy, and especially such as were ministers of the congregation, should, by often reading and meditation of God's word, be stirred up to godliness themselves 
and be more able to exhort others by wholesome doctrine and to confute them that are adversaries to the truth and further that the people, by daily hearing of Holy Scripture read in the church, should continually profit more and more in the knowledge of God and be more inflamed with the love of his true religion. I want God's word to be at the heart of the gathering of God's people, the heart of the priests, the heart of the parishioners, so inflamed to godliness that they follow God faithfully. Everything in the Book of Common Prayer is straight from the Bible. The prayers, the collects, the statements, the calls and responses, and the shape of the service, not just the guts, but the actual shape of the service reflects the good news of Jesus. Here's God. Here's you. Here's forgiveness. Here's assurance. Let's sing and pray. Let's hear God's word. Let's be built up. Let's go out to tell the world. That's the structure of a Cranmer service. Second, at the heart of the Book of Common Prayer was Cranmer's desire that everything should be heard in the plain language of the people. And moreover, whereas St Paul would have had such language spoken to the people in the church as they might understand and have profit by hearing the same, the service in the Church of England these many years has been read in Latin to the people which they understood not, so that they've heard with their ears only and their heart, spirit and mind have not been edified thereby. I don't know about you, but uh, I studied Latin for four years at school. I I can't remember a word. Imagine going into a service where you could not understand a word. And Kramer said, that's not on. It needs to be in plain English. And notice that he got the order right. The Bibles were put in plain English first and then the Book of Common Prayer. And you notice that one of the other results of that is that people could now participate. There's no other denomination in the world that has so much understandable participation. It's not a drive through where you come in and get your shot of religion and drive out. It's a household gathered together, doing stuff together, praying, proclaiming, confessing, singing, talking. Moreover, if you are illiterate, you can understand everything that is going on because it's in the language you use in the marketplace. And so you can come to memorise these services, even if you can't read them, if you come every day. Third, Cramer desired the service to be basic and simple. It is more profitable because here I left out many things whereof some may be untrue, some uncertain, some vain and superstitious, and is ordained nothing to be read but the very pure word of God, the Holy Scriptures, or that which is evidently grounded upon the same. And that in such a language and order as is most easy and plain for the understanding both of the readers and the hearers, It is also more commodious both for the shortness thereof and for the plainness of the order and for that the rules be few and easy. Keep it simple. Uh, That doesn't mean he says the services should be short, but they should be uncomplicated. Anyone should be able to walk off the street and have a basic understanding of what was going on, even if they'd never been past third class. Fourth, Cranmer desired uniformity, and where heretofore there hath been great diversity in saying and singing in churches within this whole realm, now from henceforth all the whole realm shall have but one use. Now, it might have been political reasons for that, everyone on the same page, so there's no revolution, but basically Cranmer wanted that whenever you went into a church, wherever you were in the kingdom, you knew what you were getting. And my dad likes to say it's kind of like religious McDonald's. You know what's on the menu. With little variations depending on the accent. But you were able to walk into church anywhere and know that you'll get God's word in plain English in a basic form. Fifth, Cranmer was flexible. Cranmer was flexible. 
and to the end that the congregation may be thereby edified, neither that any man shall be bound to the saying of them, but such as from time to time shall serve the congregation. There is to be flexibility in what we are doing. There is to be flexibility in how we structure it. There is to be flexibility in the language. There is to be flexibility in the order. There is to be inflexibility about the content. So wherever you go, it's possible to revise and reform. And and Cremer did that. Uh, In in 1552, the prayer book was reformed. Uh, Also a number of other times. So that by 1662, you had the final one after a number of reformations and revisings. But the purpose was to build God's people up with God's word, not to so constrain them that the prayer book became the master because Jesus was Lord. So here's what Cramer desired. In services to be shaped and focused on God's word, in plain English, in simple structure, in familiarity, and always open to reformation so that whoever comes in may meet God through Jesus Christ. Now, whatever else you want to say about the Book of Common Prayer, and it's not perfect, and let me tell you that it's not the Bible, it certainly matches what we heard the Bible said church was about, that it put the word of God at the heart so that God's people might be inflamed towards godliness. Which brings us to our last question. How does what we do here each week stack up against that? Now, there are some differences to the Book of Common Prayer. I think if Cranmer saw a data projector, he'd have conniptions. We use musical instruments that probably weren't being used in that way in those days. We have age-appropriate teaching, and we have a lot more songs in the services than they did. But I want you to just take a moment. Think about the service as we've already had it today. Think about how much Bible we've already had. Think about the kids' talk. Think about the headings and the pictures we use. Think about the content. Think about how we finish. Think about the substance and the shape. Our desire is that every part of our service is focused on God's word. On a superficial level, that's our headings. On a more substantial level, every part of our service aims to express the content of God's word. And on an even deeper level, if you just look at the shape of our service, we desire for that shape to be the shape of the good news of Jesus because this is our desire. People come to know God better through God's one and only Son. Every part of our service aims to have easier to understand English. We try to use words that are familiar, so we don't do Holy Communion. We do the Lord's Supper. We don't often use the word church. We use the words mob or household. When we use religious jargon, we try to translate it, sin is, repentance is. Our desire is for these services to be understandable. That doesn't mean they're easy. We've got to use some of our heart and brain matter, but our leaders and those who put the services and the things together are aiming to be understandable. There is something here for everyone. Every part of our service aims to be basic and familiar. The same components, things that people know, so that if we're not great at reading, we can memorise stuff. We won't feel left out. We can be part of God's community. Our desire is that when we walk in, we know how the household hangs out, especially with their God. And we're always open to reformation based on the town we live in, based on the cultures we dwell in, based on the way our languages will change. Our hope and desire is that when we gather as God's people, We meet God through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, in God's word. 
that we do it in language that is similar to the language we might use at Woolies or at soccer, that our services are reasonably simple and basic, that we're always open to change based on God's word and the world we live in. We desire to gather with services that inflame our desire for godliness. That is what it means, not just to be Anglican, but to be biblical. Let me pray. Father, thanks for Cranmer. I thank you for how ordinary he was. He was extraordinary in some of the things he did, Father, but he dealt with grief and mourning. He dealt with temptation and stumbling. He dealt with doubt and fear, and he gave his life for the good news of Jesus being put into the hands of ordinary men and women. Father, thank you that you gather us, that you give us your word so that we can hang out with you and each other. Father, help us as we think about our gatherings together to be desiring to put you in front of everyone so that we come to know you and are inflamed to godliness. In Jesus' name, amen.